So today I wanna to share with you guys my story for how I got into the licensing business from the very beginning. Now I've shared bits and pieces of the story throughout some of my videos, but this is gonna be a complete A to Z. Where I was, how I was struggling, why I was screwing things up so badly, and why I decided that TV, film, music licensing was the best path for me to take, and why I'm so thankful and so glad and have no regrets for taking this path, and why it's absolutely sent me on this path to do music full time and prove all the naysayers and the haters and the doubters wrong over the years, right? Now, I wanna share this with you because I bet at some point in this story, you're gonna see yourself, right? That I'm just like you. I was in a band, I was struggling, I was a dreamer, I had a big pipe dream of making it big and getting a record deal and touring the world, right? I was right alongside there with probably many of you that have those dreams and those ambitions. My situation was that I had no idea really how to get there. I had a lot of dreams and a lot of ambition, but when it came down to actually executing on my plan of getting to full-time income with music, I was clueless, just completely naive, had no idea what I was doing. So in the very beginning, uh, I had many bands throughout high school. I had punk bands, rock bands, all that kind of stuff. Now back then, there was really no idea that this was gonna become a job. I just was having fun. I wanted to play with my friends. We wanted to play shows to impress the girls, right? Of course, in our classes. So that was really my motivating factor. As I got into college, uh, high school and into college, I started gr uh, putting together more serious projects, right? And started putting together bands where we wanted to have a website and have a mailing list and started to tour and wanted to actually start to grow something into something that could actually be our jobs and be our careers. Now, when I was in college in Northern California, I started a band and we really didn't build any buzz, even locally at all. We played shows once a month, probably not that often. And we were very much perfectionists. We were like, well, we're not going to play any shows until every single song is 100% done, 100% polished. And we rehearsed them for like a month straight. We were overly perfectionist about how we were going to present our music. So that prevented us from playing as many shows as we probably need to. Um, and then when it came down to at the end of our shows, going out and getting email addresses and trying to build a fan base, we were terrible at it. We just were too shy. We weren't really good about going and, and selling ourselves and promoting ourselves to people. Um, we got a couple of local radio play stations and that was really fun and really exciting. But then it, when it came to like pushing ourselves to promoters and trying to get gigs maybe even outside of our little town, we really didn't do it that much. We literally were just kind of sitting around going, no, you just need to make really great music and the world comes to you, right? The whole industry comes to you. That's where a lot of you know, bands and producers and musicians get it wrong. Uh, even the most talented ones, even if you do have that incredible talent, if you're not selling your music, you're not promoting your music, you're not doing anything to market yourself, people don't just accidentally discover you. That really is not how the world works. You have to put yourself in a visible place for people to discover you, right? So that was mistake number one with that band. Uh, we ended up breaking up. I ended up moving to LA because I wanted to go do something in the music industry and I knew that LA is the place to be involved there. So I had a degree, which was kind of worthless. I had a, a recording arts and music business degree from college as I had those bands going on, right? So I graduated, packed everything up literally the day that I walked across the, uh, the graduation stage, had my truck completely piled up with everything that I owned, moved down to LA, okay? Now in LA, I got involved in a new band. Now, this band had a lot more success than the previous ones. So, what happened with this band is it was basically uh, my brother and I were roommates. He plays guitar, I play drums, and we just started jamming. We had a mutual friend who also knew a rapper. Um, they were buddies, and he, uh, he introduced my brother and I to this rapper. So, we started kind of jamming on some sort of hip hop rock kind of stuff, just having fun, really nothing serious, right? We didn't know we were gonna start a band. And this rapper happened to be like really good friends with Tyrese Gibson, the R&B singer, actor, you know, Fast and the Furious, Transformers, right? Pretty big, uh, pretty, pretty big guy in Hollywood. And uh, Tyrese sort of heard some of our demos. Um, also, we, we ended up bringing on a singer. So we basically had a vocalist and a rapper. So we were kind of doing a, a little bit of a Linkin Park sort of a sound there, but a little bit more in the punk world. Anyway, so our music uh, was pretty interesting and kind of unique and it had a really interesting flow to it. Tyrese ended up hearing one of our demos, one song that we did, um, and he got so excited by that song that he ended up signing us to his sort of production label, right? It wasn't a record label, it wasn't something that had distribution or something that could have us on tour uh, or give us that kind of a budget, but basically it put a little bit of pocket uh, money in our, uh, a little bit of chump change in our pockets 
and he let us use his production studio. He had this massive, you know, multi-million dollar studio in the center of Hollywood, right there on uh, Coenga and Hollywood Boulevard. And so we were signed to his label. Now, this is the most success I had ever seen in the license or license in the music industry, right? And Tyrese was definitely representing us to uh, labels. We met with the CEOs and the heads of A&R of every major label that you can think of, okay? We were taking meetings, we were talking to people. Now, the mistake we made with this band, though, is because, you know, I'm 21, 22 at the time, very young still, and you have this major, this is just when Transformers came out, right? So Tyrese is the one of the bigger stars coming out at that time. He has all this juice, all this cloud, all this attention, and now he's getting all this media attention that he has his band. We were called Life Nine, okay? So the band is now getting all this attention because we're associated with a major Hollywood star, right, and an R&B singer. So our mistake at this point was thinking, we're good, we've got success, right? He can just walk us into any meeting we want, we're definitely gonna get a deal, we're gonna get a record deal, we're gonna get a publishing deal. We just get, we now get to just kind of choose who we wanna work with and we're gonna go tour the world and we're gonna be opening up for all these major acts. Uh, I remember at one point, somebody had made a promise to us that we were gonna open for Linkin Park in some uh, you know, massive uh, concert in Africa and we're like, oh, awesome. I mean, again, 21, 22 years old, I mean, put yourself in those shoes, right? You got somebody this big believing in your music, signing you, walking you into basically any meeting you want. You might think the same thing, right? But that was definitely our naive mistake. Just getting ahead of ourselves and taking it for granted that we would already be there. So we didn't really actually even work that hard, I'll be honest with you. That's, that's the big regret that I have about that project is, at least for myself, I'm speaking for myself, I probably and definitely could have worked way, way harder with that group, um, but I, I just kind of assumed like we're already in, right? And just somebody's gonna take care of this success for us. So another very, very terrible career ending mistake for me there. Now, while I'm also in this band, um, I'm trying to also network myself individually as a producer. I was producing music for my home studio. I had Logic Pro at the time, I still use Logic Pro. And I had a manager and basically he was trying to get me into the circles of other people, right? So he would call me up, hey, you know, Chris Brown is in the studio, I'm in here, bring your guitar, maybe you can get a feature on his track or something, right? This is what my basic life became for many, many months, I think almost a couple of years in LA when I was down there. So I had a day job, right? I had to pay the bills, I had my band, and then I'm also trying to network as an individual producer. So I'd go to these studio sessions very, very late at night. I mean, I'd get there at 9 p.m., we wouldn't get home till 4 a.m. If you've never been in a studio session in LA, there's gonna be at least four blunts being passed around all the time. The room is filled with smoke. It's like kind of a party atmosphere and you know, you're basically there. If you're not scheduled to be there, like you're not actually being asked to be there because you need to record something on the album, most of the time you're sitting on the couch in the back of the room absorbing smoke and secondhand smoke from other other people. Now I'm not a big like weed smoker, so for me it was just like, okay, I gotta get out of here. My clothes are gonna smell. I don't wanna be high when I'm driving home. So it was kind of just a little bit of a mess for me. Not to mention, you get home at 4 a.m. I still have a day job, gotta wake up at 8 or 9 a.m. to go to my job. I smell like smoke, I'm running on fumes, I gotta drink another Red Bull, more coffee in the morning, and I'm running basically on sugar and caffeine. So it's a very unhealthy situation. Now, in the course of all of this, I was introduced to a guy who owned a music catalog, a music library basically for the TV film business. We had met with him as our band, and as a band we decided, well, we can't really give up our publishing because we are, again, we're gonna get signed by a major label, so we, we can't really do that, which for us it made sense because that's where our ultimate goal was. We didn't wanna get exclusively into licensing. We wanted to tour. We wanted to become you know charting artists, basically. So as a band, we said no to that. But I basically stuck behind the meeting and I said, hey man, I think maybe something like this could work for me individually. Maybe not as a band, we're not gonna give you our music, but I'm, a, I'm an individual producer, I make music, I'm making music all the time. Maybe this is an outlet that I can make some money with, right? I would like to give this a shot. So he gave me a contract. I got my first couple of albums done with him. Um, and I started to see like, wow, like when I do music licensing, I'm getting a check. He gave me upfront consideration fees and a contract. I signed my first actual licensing contract, right? Licensing deal with his library. And then on the side, I'm still going to these late night sessions and trying to be sort of like, you know, le leeching off of the coattails of other successful people, like, you know, the major artists that are, that are out there. 
Now, what started to become very clear to me, you know, within a couple of months is like, okay, so on the one hand, I'm chasing, you know, basically trying to become a plus one for all these established producers and writers, and I want to get my track placed with them, or I want to put guitars uh, on their song or something like that, and that, that's how my path to success can be. But I'm staying here till four in the morning. Some sessions and most sessions, I'm not even getting on the track. I'm just sitting there like a moron uh, in the back of the room, coming home, smelling like smoke and being extremely tired for my next day. And on the other hand, I'm getting checks and contracts from music licensing. And I get to make music from home. I don't have to be out till four in the morning. I don't have to be around people who are blowing me, blowing smoke down my lungs all night long. And... Uh, and I have a lot more control over this, right? I can actually not wait to get a feature on a, on a record. I can actually make all the records that I want to do. So it was becoming very clear to me that one of these is the path of least resistance, right? One of them felt like more of a pipe dream that, you know, I'd, I'd hopefully maybe one day stumble into the right situation. And the other one was actually getting me real results. And I was actually seeing, I hadn't got any placements yet, but I was definitely getting money and a contract signed. So in that situation for me, it was very clear which one of these seemed to be the path for me, right? Because when you get results and you start seeing actual positive things happening, uh, not saying I got rich overnight, but at least something, right? At least some money was coming in. At least I was signing contracts. At least my music was getting distributed and getting out there. I was like, this has got to be where I go. This is like my epiphany. Like, uh, duh, like I got to go in this way. Now, during in the background of all this happening, and I'm noticing where my career might be starting to drift uh, or take a direction, I had this terrible, awful, stressful day job. It was, a, it was one of those day jobs where I got a stomachache every time I walked in every morning, okay? It was a startup company, and it was out in Santa Monica. And if you've ever worked for a startup, you know how stressful it can be. I mean, you're, you get contracted to be a 40-hour-a-week employee, but they really expect you to be there 80 hours, right? You leave at 5 p.m., and you get all these looks like, okay, I guess, uh, yeah, I guess you're technically allowed to go, but there's all this excuse me, pressure that you're going to stay and you're going to just burn the candle at both ends because you believe that this is going to be the next big thing. And, you know, the company was very poorly managed and I really didn't understand the real mission objectives of the entire company. And it felt like they didn't really have a very, very clear understanding of the space that they were in and what they were trying to do and how they were trying to compete. So it's a very frustrating thing. And also being told by upper management, we want all of your ideas. We want you guys to really feel like this is your company too. We would bring our ideas and we would all be immediately shut down, us underlings, right? Us people that were not in management. So it's super frustrating, right? In the beginning, I believed, I was excited. But as time goes on, you keep getting told like, you're not really part of this company. Well, okay, so I'm gonna start to believe you. I'm really not a part of this company. So my heart, left the business. It left that company. I was just not really into this at all. And so I started basically slacking off. I mean, I'll just be honest with you guys. I was coming to work, uh, bad attitude, not feeling like working, doing the bare minimum. Um, just my heart wasn't in it, right? My heart was in racing home at 5 p.m. to make licensable music. Like that was my whole dream. I was like, okay, I'm getting money here. I see the vision here. I believe in it. It's my career. I'm going to make myself wealthy. This is where my heart is at, and my day job really started to suffer, uh, and upper management started taking notice of this, and actually, it was the first job I ever got fired from, and not only did I get fired, I got yelled out of the building. It's kind of funny to admit, but I've never been fired by any job up until this point, but my attitude had gotten so sour and so just, ugh, I don't care about this anymore, that I was basically, uh, the CEO pulled me into his office one, it was a Tuesday morning, I remember, first thing in the morning, like we started the day at like nine, this was like 9.15, he says, Jesse, I need to talk to you, get in here, go in there. He basically just berates me about how I'm just dragging my feet, I don't care, I'm a, just a, a negative influence, I'm dragging the whole company down, right? I get the work, the works from this guy. He just drags me through the ringer. And he's just like, all right, clear out your desk, I want you out of here in five minutes. So it's like, wow. So. Literally, you know, security comes, watches me, pack all my stuff up, make sure I'm not going to take anything. I mean, it was very dramatic. The whole, and we lived, we were um, working in basically a warehouse where all the employees can hear everything. And uh, there really wasn't any barrier between me and the, uh, and, and the office that the CEO was in. So basically everybody's hearing that conversation and hearing him yelling at me at the top of his lungs. So very embarrassing. And it was uh, just, I mean, I'm shaking, just absolutely shaking, just scared angry, uh, just upset, like it was just just a mess, right? And so I'm out the door and that's it. I am now unemployed and I'm looking at the future and I'm thinking, okay, 
that was a terrible situation. I hated waking up, going to a job that gave me a stomach ache, that made me feel bad, not having my heart in it. Um, I know music licensing is a bigger goal for myself. I know that it's gonna take time to get there, but I believe that I can. And the one thing that really actually, I'll be honest with you guys, that pushed me through, um, you know, deciding, well, okay, let me just go get another day job, is the CEO said something to me that really pissed me off and really got me angry and actually gave me the fuel to say, to hell with it, I'm doing music licensing. He told me, he said, the mistakes you're making right now are going to basically end your entire career in the music industry. This business was in the music industry. And he told me that like, because I was making these mistakes in his company, that my entire career was just dead. Like basically that I had sealed my fate and this was the end of my entire career. You can imagine how angry <laughs> that made me and how pissed off I was and how spiteful I became because of that. Because the audacity of somebody to say, I control your career and because you're not making me wealthy anymore and you're not working for my company, you have no career in front of you and you're not gonna succeed. To try to sabotage somebody like that just with a mental trick like that, oh, that got under my skin and that pissed me off so bad. Um, and that anger and that spite and that just absolute um, fury that I felt was actually one of the big deciding biggest deciding factors for me deciding I'm all in. Music licensing, I believe in myself. I think I can do this. I'm already seeing some success. I'm already seeing that I'm getting into this uh, industry um, and starting to see. And I think at this point, I had maybe a couple of placements under my belt. So it was like, okay, uh, I hadn't, hadn't been paid for them, but I got the notification that I got some placements. So I had enough of a sort of sense of like, I have something to offer the, to this industry. And to hell with that guy. That guy is not going to be my fate. That guy's hatred uh, and, and, um, and just discounting of me is not gonna be my story. That, I don't know what his deal is and what his problem is, but I'm gonna prove him wrong and I'm going to prove uh, him wrong basically for myself to prove that no, that company and that situation was not my entire career. That was a gig. That was one job. That was one thing that I was doing but I'm bigger than that and I can manage my own career. I can make myself wealthy. I can absolutely uh, be in charge of my own uh, schedule and, and be as productive as I wanna be and not be held down um, and sort of condescended to by managers and bosses that I don't really respect. So maybe you're in that situation now. You have that kind of day job where you're feeling that sort of spite and anger and that feeling of like, man, I just keep making them rich and I'm not doing anything for myself. That's where I was, okay? So in the course of all of this, after um, I'm unemployed, I have a little bit of success, but really nothing that I could say I have, you know, any, not even part-time income, nothing really, but feeling like, and just having this belief in myself that I think I can make this work for myself. I, you know, screwed up big time in the first couple of years in this process, right, where I'm kind of like now on my own, now I really gotta make music licensing work because I have no other option, I really just, decided and made a commitment to myself. I don't care what I do, I will never be in that situation again where I have to say good morning and pretend to be happy and nice and excited about a company or a job that I just have no passion for. I, I made a commitment to myself that day. Never again will I do that, I don't care. I will clean toilets for a living, I will do anything as long as I'm a self-employed independent contractor, I'll never do that again. So that was one thing that was definitely driving me throughout all this. Now, in the beginning, I was terrible with my schedule. I'd sleep until noon, right? I, I had, I was, you know, stay up way too late. Um, I didn't have a production schedule. I was definitely not making licensable music in the beginning. Some of it landed, a lot of it didn't though. Um, I did sign some deals and some contracts that gave up portion, uh, portion sometimes up to 50% of my writer share when the people that I was giving that writer share to were not writing on my tracks, we're not contributing to my music, right? It was just sort of this pressure of like, well, if you wanna get into this situation, you're gonna kinda of have to play ball. I didn't have anybody in front of me saying like, oh, hold on, hold on, no, you probably wanna think twice about signing over your writer's um, uh, income, because you know that's gonna be your primary bread and butter, and you know what that's gonna feel like when you see a royalty check and like some other dude is making money off of you and he didn't actually help you with that track? Now the publishing, yes, like if somebody's helping administer your song and getting it placed, they should earn their share for that, but the writer side, that's for me, right? I spent the time and the money uh, and the energy to put my studio together to make that music and to you know, lose sleep over the music that I'm making. Um, so that 100% that should be with me, right? Because I'm making that creative effort. So I signed bad deals, made really just not great music in the beginning. And so a lot of the time uh, in the first couple of years were just not spent very smartly. <laughs> I don't know. And uh, it, it just wasn't a great situation in the beginning. Now, 
as time goes on with anything, you know, you get on a bike for the first time, you're gonna fall over, you have no balance, you don't know what you're doing. You start to learn from your mistakes though. And so what I started to see with my royalties is, okay, these tracks keep getting placed and then these ones don't. So what was the difference? I'd go back, listen to my music, I'm like, oh, okay, well this, these tracks have these elements and they keep getting placements. Those tracks don't have those elements and those are just sitting on the shelf. Or these tracks seem to be a little bit more upbeat and optimistic and more energetic and they're, they're getting a lot of placements. Those ones are a little bit slower and kind of melodramatic and maybe almost like a ballad and they're just sitting on the shelf. So I started coming up with my own golden rules for what I should start to do with my music if I want to get things placed, okay? And then as I talked to more people and as I sort of signed those bad deals and realized from other producers, dude, why are you signing over your writer share? You shouldn't be doing that. Realize, wow, okay, I need to get smarter about this business. I need to be a little bit more professional. Also, double checking my registrations. There were tracks that were missing from my registrations from my B, uh, ASCAP at the time, uh, my ASCAP profile, and I didn't know that I was supposed to double check that kind of stuff. I figured, oh, you know, libraries will take care of that, right? Sometimes I do, sometimes there's errors, and your name doesn't get credited for the songs that you wrote, right? And that means you're missing out on 100% of all of your writer's share. So as time get, went on, I got better. I got better, I got better, I got better. I refined my skills production-wise, business-wise, all that stuff, okay? So you fast forward uh, about eight years into the business. I think it was about eight years, yeah. I hit a major, major block, a major sort of quitting point for myself. And I, I actually uh, pretty much gave, gave up on music licensing. I walked away from the business. Now, why did I do that? Two main reasons. Number one, I was isolated. I did not have a community around me. I was working from my home studio at that point. I was still, I was in Vegas actually. Um, and you know, I had some other friends that made music, but really when you're in this business, we're working from our home studios. We're pretty much isolated just by the nature of the fact that you're working from home. And most people don't understand what you're doing. They might think it's, oh, that's cool. You're doing TV music, but they don't get what it's like to be in this industry every day and have to stay inspired and create licensable music, right? All the things that we deal with. So I was isolated, that was number one. I didn't have a community of people to kind of, hey, get me back on the horse. Can you guys inspire me? Can I tell you about how I'm feeling right now and how I'm feeling just completely worthless and not excited uh, and just uninspired? So I didn't have that. And then number two, I felt like I was making cover versions of the previous songs I had already made, right? So I kind of got into this sort of formula phase of my, my music making where I knew it worked and I just kept doing it over and over and over and over again. Absolutely, the placements came in. The money was coming in, everything was growing, but my heart, my heart was not in it anymore. I felt lost. I just felt um, like, uh, like I was in a black hole. Like I just was not inspired, I wasn't excited. I would get all these briefs every day and, and, and honestly, you might not believe this, but I dreaded making music. I got these, you know, hey, we need to make music for a Dual Survivor or uh, what was it, Long Island Medium or all these TV shows. Guaranteed placements, right? Imagine you got a guaranteed placement in your inbox. Just make some music and we're gonna definitely throw it into this TV show. You'd be like over the moon, right? Enough of that was happening though that it, it wasn't special or new to me anymore and I was just making crap, just like whatever, just template kind of music, stuff that I had made so many times before. So I basically ended up walking away from the licensing business and I told all my partners and all my libraries, hey guys, um, give, me, give me a couple of weeks here, maybe a month or two. I need to get my head on straight. I don't know if this business is gonna be something I can do forever. I'm just literally hitting a wall right now. I can't do it. I had hit minor walls uh, in those eight years, but that eight year wall, when I hit it, that was the hardest one because it really made me think I might need to get into another industry, another career, do something completely different. Now in that two to three month period where I wasn't doing any music, uh, this idea came to me. I don't know where it came from, but it just came to me and it was, why don't you create some sort of an online community of producers that also either are in this business or want to get into this business? Because I've been asked by, I can't tell you how many of my fellow producer friends and, uh, and colleagues, Jesse, that's really cool. You're doing this licensing thing. You're actually making like your income with it. Like, how do you do that? Uh, I got that question pretty much every week from people that I knew, you know, old bandmates, musicians, that kind of thing. And I'd always try to give them a sort of step-by-step -step guide. Here's how you do it here. And I realized, it's, it's more than just an hour long conversation on the phone. I mean, it's just, there's so many things you need to learn how to do that it can't be something that I can really just walk you through very quickly. You're gonna have to like really learn a full A to Z, like an overview of how the business works. And then not only that, how to make good music, how to make sure you're signing with good companies, signing good contracts, right? Uh, and I realized, well, I am kind of isolated. And I, I started, that, that's when the epiphany hit me that I've been very isolated in this industry. And I thought, 
I gotta create something. Like I gotta create an online group of people that no matter where we are, because I don't think I'm gonna find a bunch of people in Las Vegas. I mean, I know a couple of you guys are out in Vegas um, and I actually have some syndicate members that are in Vegas, but not a lot of people probably, but I bet online you can create a really awesome community of people from all over the world that wanna get into this business and wanna learn how to succeed. And not only that can inspire me and keep me motivated and keep me you know, really uh, gung-ho about it and also challenge me, challenge me to make better music, challenge me to get more creative with my stuff and not just make template-y cover versions of the, of the previous tracks that I've done. So I just started exploring like how would I do that? Where would I find people? Uh, how should I present myself and what should I say about why I'm creating this uh, community and, and why they should get involved in music licensing. And from literally the, one of the first couple of days that I put out a couple of videos here on YouTube, I got so many emails and comments and just positive, thank you so much. Like so many thanks from people saying, I've been looking for how to do this, how to get involved with it, or I didn't even know this existed. And thank you so much for at least exposing this to me. I think this is gonna be my path as well. And then I realized there is a big huge, massive hunger out there for people who want to learn how to get those checks and contracts, right? And they're tired of being in the band situation or in the sort of now the social media situation where they're chasing and dreaming of striking it rich and making it big and getting discovered, right? But they're not seeing any of those results. They're not seeing the things that they are dreaming of. And when they see that this is a much more practical and, and just realistic path to get to that point of making music your full-time job and getting massive exposure uh, from your home studio, it becomes a no-brainer for most producers, right? If they wanna work hard at it, of course, nothing comes to you easy, nothing comes to you super quick. You gotta work hard for this stuff, but it's here though, at least it's possible, right? It's not a pipe dream anymore. It's not a sort of just, well, if I just keep at it, keep making music, keep uploading stuff online, eventually, something will happen, right? I just watched the uh, South Park episode with the underpants gnomes. You, might, you guys might have seen that episode where uh, you know Stan asks them, how do you guys make money stealing underpants from all these kids? And they go, easy. Step one, steal underpants. Step two, big question mark, silence. Step three, profit. I'm like, whoa, 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 well, but what's step two? And I don't know, what's step two? Nobody knows what step two is, right? That's how a lot of musicians and producers are, are going through their careers right now. Step one is make music. Just make music, make music, make music, make music you want. Step two, step three, make it your full-time job, right? Big gap right there, huge question mark. How do you do that? How do you turn the music that you love into full-time income? And so I realized with the videos and the education that I can bring to the world, I can fill in that step two, that big question mark and actually have realistic answers and a step-by-step -step process to go from making the music you love, tailoring it for a certain industry, signing good contracts, partnering with good deals, uh, with good libraries, and then you get to that point three, all right, that step three, where this can be your full-time job. And since I've launched this, you guys have been an incredible community for me to be a part of. And I'm so glad that those of you that have subscribed and are along uh, the journey here with me and are making music licensing your either full-time focus or maybe you're adding it alongside uh, your career, your artist career. I just wanna thank you guys for, for giving it a shot. I mean, honestly, that's really what I wanna thank you guys for. A lot of producers say all day long, I'm dedicated, I'm talented. I've got what it takes. I'm gonna make this my full-time job. And then when I provide a step-by-step -step path to get there, some of them, yeah, well, yeah, that sounds cool. And then they don't wanna do the work, right? They don't wanna learn about it. They don't wanna get educated. They don't wanna start making more licensable music. Maybe they don't have all the answers and they're gonna to have to kind of go back to the basics a little bit. A lot of producers don't wanna put in that work. They just want to dream. They just wanna hold on to that dream of stardom and being a pop star and a rock star, right? You can absolutely become a pop star and a rock star in and through music licensing, but it takes work. And for those of you that have been sticking around here and, and every single day, getting into your studio, cranking out tracks, right? Building your catalog, educating yourself, improving your producing, mixing and mastering skills, everything that you've been doing to get to the point where this can be your full-time job. I just wanna applaud you because you're literally one of the few. You're, you are really actually, I'm not just saying that. Most producers, most musicians, artists, bands, they're dreaming. They're literally buying lottery tickets every day and hoping that this is the big one that's gonna get them there. But you're not doing that, okay? You're actually doing the work. You're actually going in there and building a career and not just dreaming one up, okay? So that's my story, guys. And I hope you see now that 
I'm nobody special. I'm nothing special. I didn't have all the answers when I first got started. I was a dreamer. I was very naive. I made a lot of mistakes. I was very close to some success in the music business. And even being that close to it, I didn't turn it into full-time income. And it wasn't until I realized that music licensing had to be my vehicle to get to where I wanted to go. That's when I started to actually get there. That's when I actually started to make significant and actionable moves that showed results, okay? Results, results, results. That's what you need to be measuring your career on. Are you getting results right now? If not, gotta change something. Something's gotta give, you gotta try a different approach, okay? Do not just keep going up to the same uh, approach you've been going and expect a different result. We all know that that's crazy. It never works out that way. So that's where I was and this is where I am now. Now, over 10 years and this is my full-time job. Still love it now. Thanks to building that online community. Thanks to you guys for joining me here. I am much more 100% certain that I will never hit that massive wall again. Absolutely, I hit writer's block. I hit lack of motivation. I get, you know, I get into a funk once in a while. We all do. You do. I do. We're all human beings, okay? But the really awesome part is now there's a community. Now there's a place where I can go online and you guys can go online and we can help each other out. We can, we can applaud each other. We can push each other and say, get back on the horse. You can still do it. Um, and we can give each other insights and knowledge and all that kind of cool information. So anyways, with all that said, I know this is a very long video. Thank you so much. If you made it this far into the video, please leave a like. Please make sure that you subscribe. Hit that bell. You'll get all the notifications for all my videos. And I hope from anything you take from this story, realize that if you ever saw yourself in, you pictured yourself where I was at any point in the story, just remember, you can get to where I am today, okay? You don't have to be some rock star, you don't have to be some incredible, ridiculous, awesomely, uh, you know, classically trained producer or musician or anything like that. I am none of those things. I use my ears, I go with my gut, I really go with my emotions, that's how I create music. But it was able, uh, that was able to get me to where I am today and it's beautiful because at the end of the day, I've proven that old CEO wrong, right? His BS that he threw my way is now completely not true, okay? My career only blossomed and exploded and did, and did exponentially better than I was ever doing with that company. And guess what? The company's out of business now. They folded years, uh, I think a couple of years after I left, okay? So they're no longer in business. They didn't succeed, I did. And I want that to be your story as well, that you were the one that pushed through, proved all the haters wrong, proved all the naysayers wrong. So thank you so much for watching. I really, really do appreciate it.